Rosie is going to be the first speaker, so Rosie Woodruff uh, is going to begin the session. Thanks very much indeed. Yes. Okay. So, there. Thank you all so much for coming. This is uh, this is a marvellous opportunity, and I'm certainly looking forward to learning a lot today. Um, so, I'm. Um, although today's uh, event is all about vaccination um, and not about culling, um, I nev nevertheless um, I'm going to present a little bit of information comparing how the two approaches work, um, just to give a sort of context. Um, so. How does this work? Do I, print, do I point it up there? Point it the other way? Ah, there we go. So I wanted to, the starting point that I wanted to, where I wanted to begin was to give you two really important, very basic but very important facts about bovine TB. The first is this is a huge problem for farmers. Um, it's, you know, this, is, this is very important. It requires a solution. And the second is that badgers are part of that problem. And I think that if we don't um, you know, take that on board, we're not going to be able to address this, this problem in an effective way. So we need to acknowledge that badgers are part of the problem. We need to do something about, that, about badgers. Um, so what I'm going to do in my talk today is I'm going to, actually as a background to, to help, uh, help inform discussion today, I'm going to give a brief refresher course on how, in general, disease dynamics works. Um, so those of you who are, I know there are professional epidemiologists in the room who are all going to be giggling at my very noddy introduction, um, but I think for some of us it will help to, to give a, a, a sort of a background to interpreting, um, not interpreting what we're going to be discussing. Um, in that context, I'll also talk about then different ways of controlling infectious diseases, especially in wildlife. Um, and then I'll talk about three ways that you might think about managing badgers. Uh, Non-selective culling of badgers, vaccination of badgers, and then uh, I'm going to talk about a combination of badger culling and vaccination, which is a, another candidate policy. I'll start out with introduction to disease dynamics. So we'll start about, out with, with the concept that there are different kinds of hosts. As, um, now, for some reason, this slide is loading really slowly. So there we go. So we're not, I'm going to start, not, we're not going to think about badgers, we're going to think about something completely uncontroversial. So imagine, if you will, a field full of giraffes. Um, these giraffes are what we call susceptible. That means they can be infected by, by a pathogen, by something which is going to cause disease. Um, and in fact, this one, who's now turned blue, indeed has become infected. In fact, it's not just infected, it's infectious. And because it's infectious, it can then transmit that infection at some point. Very slow. Here we go. <laughs> it can transmit the infection to other susceptible giraffes, so, but only to ones which are susceptible. Um, those infected animals can turn, can, can, can transmit infection on, and pretty soon we see a situation where everybody is infected, I hope. There. <laughs> okay, so now let's, let's make it slightly more complicated. We're going to introduce the concept of immunity, where after, at some point after you've become infectious, infected, you're infectious for a while, and then your immune system uh, kicks in and you become immune. You're no longer, you can no longer become infected. So we start with the same situation. We've got an infectious animal, but after some time he becomes immune, um, and um, so... It's sort of following in the in the wake of the of the of the of the spread of the disease is this spread of immunity. And once again, as uh, as things as the as the disease travels through the population, we reach a situation where um, eventually everybody becomes immune. I hope. <laughs> yes. Right. Now. What this means is now we have a population where everybody's immune. If you introduce an infected animal into that, in, into that, uh, into that population, the disease can't spread because everybody's immune. There's, there, there's, no, there's no susceptible animals left. Um, so if you think about a, uh, a, you know, a disease as a fire, um, the susceptible animals are the... Uh, are, the, you know, are the, like the fuel for the fire. And without that fuel, without those susceptibles, the, 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 the disease is going <laughs> to die out. And that is, one, that is why we see um, epidemics uh, that fade out. So this is a, you know, one, one example. Um, uh, cases of measles in people in Bristol in the 1940s. And you see a classic epidemic where you know, the disease starts to take off, loads and loads of people get infected, and then it dies out, it fades out. And that is, is due to this, this, this spread of immunity. Um, so 
if this is the case, then how do diseases ever get, ever, ever get to, you know, ever persist? Well, there's a new supply of susceptibles, and, and births are one way that new, new susceptible animals can enter a population. So in think, as we think about how these diseases tr are transmitting within populations, the structure of the population is important. So let's drop giraffes for a minute and think about people. So let's, let's call them, I don't know, Billy and Bobby. Uh, two brothers, they live in, this, in their house. They've got their little household where they live. They're part of a town of other similar families. Um, it's summer. They're, you know, they're mostly at home um, playing together. Um, little Billy gets sick. Um, he gives it to his brother. I hope gives it to his brother. <laughs> but because, because they are most, they are, their post population is structured into these households, and these kids are mostly interacting with one another at home, um, then the disease doesn't spread further than their household. Time passes, the school term arrives. Everybody goes to school, and suddenly the, 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 the way in which this population of kids is mixing changes fundamentally. Instead of being restricted to their households, now everybody is mixing together at school. And the disease transmits much, much more readily. Um, those of you who are parents will be very familiar with this concept. I know I nearly didn't make it here today for exactly this reason. Um, and when you look at, um, at the, the cases of childhood diseases in many, many um, different kinds of childhood diseases, you see a big peak at the start of the school term um, in, in sort of end of August, beginning of September. And, we, and this is widely recognised as, um, as, uh, as a very important feature in, in understanding the dynamics and control of childhood diseases. We see this, so, so what I'm trying to say is that population structure, the more structured a population is, and the, the, the more constrained mixing between, between hosts is, the slower disease is going to spread through that population. And we see exactly this with badgers and TB. So here we've got, these are data from Worcester Park from a long time ago. Um, uh, the ba badgers live in groups. Each group defends a territory. And if you look at which territories are infected, um, you can see here we've got a little focus of infection here um, in the southwest of the study area. And if you then look what happened over time is that more of that, that level of infection, that localised infection, stayed pretty stable over time. And that is... Um, primarily due to the fact that the badgers, badgers don't range very widely. Badgers tend to stay in the social groups where they, where they live. Um, and, they, and because they don't go very far, they don't carry the disease with them. So you tend to get a uh, you know, highly structured population, a lot of a very patchy infection in badgers from this. So having thought about um, disease dynamics, let's think about how we would control these diseases. So I'm going to start by thinking about culling. Um, and... I'm sorry, again, it's going really slowly. Um, so what we do with culling, I'm thinking about non-selective culling. So here we've got our, our, go back to our infected and unsusceptible giraffes. We go in and we're going to randomly cull about half of them. Um, so what have we done in doing that? We have, um, we've got fewer infected hosts. So that's good. There's less, there's less, fewer sources of infection. We've also got fewer susceptible hosts. So we've got less fuel for the fire, if you like. And we've also, because I chose giraffes because of the way they interact, they don't have stable social groups. They, they, um, they, they move around quite freely and associate quite, quite freely with one another. We've got less frequent contact between infected and susceptible hosts. So we've, we've got fewer animals to give disease, fewer animals to give disease to, and less or fewer opportunities for them to transmit that infection. And so what you would expect there under that circumstance is that you should see the prevalence of inf infection, the proportion of infected animals go down. And, and in some cases, it does, it works. So this is, uh, these are possums, um, uh, brush-tailed possums from New Zealand. This is, this is prevalence here of, of TB in these possums in a study area. The dotted line is a model for what you would expect, and the solid line is what was actually observed. And you can see that after, after about four or five years of culling, um, the prevalence of infection was forced down. So in principle, this, this is something you might expect to work. So that's culling. Let's think about vaccination. Again, it's not changing. But, so vaccination is going to work in a really different way. Again, we've got our, our here we've got, remember, we have this situation naturally where we have all these immune animals and they can't be infected by this, this infected animal coming in because they're immune. What vaccination does is to create the circumstance artificially. You take susceptible animals or susceptible people, you vaccinate them, you make them immune without them having to go through that process of being infected. 
And this works really well. Um, so it removes susceptibles by making them immune. There's no impact on, on uh, individuals who are already infected. Nevertheless, despite that, it, um, nevertheless, it really, really works. And there's lots and lots and lots of examples uh, of this. Here's, here's um, vaccination controlling measles in people. Um, this, and, and here's a case where... Uh, for with, with the rabies vaccination that David was talking about, where the bars here show the area of, of, of Europe under oral rabies vaccination for, for foxes, and the lines show um, the, the number of cases of rabies that were being reported. And you can see over time um, that oral rabies vaccination was able to make many countries in Western Europe rabies-free. The, the third thing I want to talk about is selective culling. Um, so selective culling, this is what we do with cattle. This is, this is culling which is targeted at infectious, infected animals. Now, in our, my giraffe example, selective culling is really easy because you can look at them and see which ones are infected. So here we go, we come in with our, with our gun and we shoot out all the infected ones. Um, that's great, now there's no infection. Um, there's another layer of what you could consider doing where you then come in and vaccinate the, the animals which are, are not infected. Um, they become immune, and then when our infected animal comes in, the disease can't, can't take hold anymore. So that's the principle. Those are the principles. Uh, th 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 so these are, th these are three different approaches which, which all act in different ways, but in principle, all ought to be able to control disease. So what actually happens? So this is what non-selective badger culling is meant to do. Um, so we've got here, this is, uh, this is before we do anything, um, we've got... Badgers in territories, the hexagon's supposed to show territories. The, the things that look like ordinary badgers are un, uninfected. The black ones are infected. And I've highlighted in pink the territories where, uh, which are occupied by infected animals. So what non-selective culling is meant to do is, is we've, here I've taken about, out about 70% of the, of the badgers <coughs> randomly. So what we end up with left is we've got fewer infected badgers than we had before. So some areas that were, did have infected badgers now don't. Um, we've got fewer susceptible animals for them to, to, to go on and infect. Um, and the hope is then that there would be less transmission uh, and less transmission onto cattle as well. So what actually happens when you cull badgers? Well, this is, this is a map from the randomized badger culling trial, and one of many that we have. Um, and what you can see on the right-hand side of the graph here this is inside the culling area. This is outside. The stars are badger sets, burrows where badger live, badgers live. The dots are badger latrines that badgers use to mark out their territories, and the polygons show badger home ranges. And what you can see first is that you can see a lot fewer, lower density of sets, a lot lower density of latrines inside the culling area than outside. That's, that's an indication that badger numbers have been reduced. You also see a lot more, a lot larger home ranges inside the culling area than outside. Um, and a lot more overlap. Um, there's a lot, it's a lot messier um, outside than inside. Inside than outside, sorry. So what, we, what happened in the randomized badger culling trial was we saw a rapid drop in badger numbers. So this is, along here we've got the, the sequential annual culls. This is how many badgers we caught in the first, on average in the first cull, the second cull, the third cull. And you can see after about cull three, you, you reach a bit of a plateau. Um, but you do see this initially quite serious drop. In, in badger numbers. Interestingly, the number of infected badgers fell more slowly. You can see this, this decline here is much slower than this decline. Why is that? Well, I'll talk about why it is in a moment. Um, but what, so the reason that, that this declines more slowly is because as we repeated these culls, so the proportion of infected badgers increased on successive culls. So um, this is a slightly complicated because uh, I've, I've, I have to do it all relative to the first cull. But by about the fourth cull, you've roughly doubled the proportion of infected badgers. Um, so as you cull, each badger is more like each, bad each surviving badger, each remaining badger in the area is more likely to be infected than it than it was before. So what culling actually does, compared with what it actually did, so it disrupts the territorial system of badgers. In so doing, it increases opportunities for contact between members between badgers, which hitherto, previously were, were in separate social groups, didn't interact much. Now they're much better able to, to interact because, this, because the social structure has been disrupted. That increases opportunities for disease transmission. We get a higher proportion of infected animals. And that also increases the number of cattle herds that badgers are able, each badger is able to come into contact with because they're ranging more widely. 
So each survive, although there are fewer badgers, each surviving badger is less, is, each surviving badger is more likely to be able to infect cattle. Um, so if we can compare these, I just want to summarise, um, and I, I've just put, to get, put large and small scale culling because they have slightly different effects on cattle. So under large scale culling, badger numbers are much reduced. The proportion that are infected is increased, though. So those are two opposing things. You've got fewer badgers, but each one's more infected, infectious. And what we see is that uh, we saw uh, less, fewer incidents of, cattle t of confirmed cattle TB inside the culling areas, but more on adjoining land. When we did uh, uh, non-selective but small-scale culls, we, we somewhat reduced badger numbers. We still increased the, pr the proportion of infected badgers, but overall we just saw more TB in cattle. So let's park culling for a minute and think about vaccination of badgers. So what vaccination is meant to do is something quite different. So the idea is you, you go out and you, you do just the same thing as you would do with, in that form of culling. You go out, you catch badgers, but instead of culling them, killing them, you, you vaccinate them. You'll get about the same proportion, about, maybe about 70% in this case. So here we've vaccinated. The, 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 these ones that have turned blue have been vaccinated. Um, there is going to be no effect on the animals who are already infected. So they say the same. But it should, but you have fewer, um, fewer susceptibles. These animals are not in contact uh, so, for example, this infected badger is, is barely in contact with any susceptible animals now. So, it should reduce the onward transmission of infection. And over time, as you repeat this annually, the, uh, those infected animals should die off. Uh, the prevalence of infection, the proportion of infected animals should die off, should, should increase, so should fall away over time. And actually, this, this structure of the badger population, which, which limits disease spread, actually is likely to enhance the, the benefits of vaccination. And it, by remaining in place. So um, we know that um, we, we expect that under, under badger vaccination, the numbers of badgers are unchanged. The, the, there is evidence, that, which we'll hear later, that this does reduce transmission of infection within the badger population. We don't know what the impact on cattle TB is. I've put this in brackets. This is from a model. So, so a mathematical model suggests that this should have at least caused some reduction in, in TB. Um, in cattle, but we don't have the empirical data to confirm that yet. Um, and just now I can highlight what the costs are. Um, although vaccination is often represented as being much more costly than, uh, uh, than culling, um, actually that e excludes the cost of policing. You'll be aware in the news at the moment of all the what's going on in Somerset and Gloucestershire, there's a very high cost of policing. And if vaccination doesn't require that level of policing, it actually means that vaccination is cheaper. But Cheaper, but we don't know whether how effective it is for cattle. So finally, I wanted to talk about combinations of badger, uh, badger culling and vaccination. I'm going to talk about selective culling. So what this is intended to do, so you've got, again, we've got our, here we've got our population of infected, uh, population including infected badgers. We, 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 we trap them, we test them with the, best, with the currently available tests. If there is no, um, so we, here we're going to have two, two scenarios. One is if, if that... Uh, if there's no social perturbation associated with this. So we're going to oops, we're going to vaccinate the animals which are test negative, so they turn blue, about, so about 70% of them are turning blue, um, and we are able to detect about half of the infected badgers using the, 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 the test which is available that you could use at the trap side. So we'll, we'll detect and cull about half of the infected badgers. So you can see that we've gone from having here, in this silly example, four infected badgers to just two. So there are still infected badgers there, but if you look here, if you look at the susceptibles that are in contact, we've gone here from having, in this case, five susceptibles in contact with infected badgers to just one. Just, you know, and I, you know, I didn't fix this, I just did it and then looked at what the, what the, what the, what the numbers look like. So here, we're probably having an impact. Uh, look, looks quite good, even though, we, even though we've missed some of the infected animals are still there, nevertheless, there are opportunities to on, to, to allow onward transmission of infection have been curtailed by the vaccination that's being done in, alongside the culling. That's if there's no social perturbation. What if there is perturbation? So here I've done exactly the same thing except I've allowed where in the social groups where badgers are culled and in those social groups which adjoin at, at, least, at least two culled groups, I've allowed them to increase their ranging behaviour. So now we've got a bit of mess. Ooh, sorry. Got a bit of mess here. You go back. Um, now, 
the, the number of, of, although we've got exactly the same number of infected animals as we had here, we've got a lot more susceptible animals in contact with infected animals, a lot more opportunities for transmission to, be, to, be, to occur. So um, a model done by the, um, what used to be Central Science Lab and now part of AHVLA in 2009 reached this really important conclusion. So they did a model. They said, if, so if, this, if this approach pr produced no perturbation, then basically you saw a reduction in the number of infected badgers and a reduction in, in, in TB and cattle as well. If it did result, if this selective culling did result in perturbation, then you saw a dramatic increase in the number of infected badgers and the number of herd breakdowns. So there's a, this, for, at least for this particular strategy, the modelling suggests that this issue of whether or not perturbation happens becomes really important. But bear in mind, the numbers of badgers that we're taking out are very small. So um, my colleague John Bilby, who's here today, uh, and I and, and some others have been working on a, a project looking at what, what the effect of small-scale culling may be on badger social groups and badger societies, and just to um, take one highlight out of that work, um, this, this graph estimates the threshold number of badgers that you need to cull during uh, the 1986-1988 period to see an increase in territory size at the start of the randomised badger culling trial in 1998-2002. Uh, this, this is where you, you, you basically run the model a thousand times, different subsets of the data, and see what, the, what, the, what threshold is, fits the data best. And in this case, culling one badger usually seems to be sufficient to prompt an increase in territory size. So it looks as though, from this information, it looks as though we're more in this area than in this area. So just to then add my selective culling here. Uh, our badger numbers are somewhat reduced. <laughs> the modelling suggests, therefore, that badger TB would be increased, cattle TB likely to be increased, and this is also quite expensive. So to conclude, so we've got these three methods, non-selective culling, vaccination, and selective culling. They function in really different ways, um, but in principle, they all have the potential to control disease and wildlife. But population structure is really important on disease transmission rates, not just in badgers, but also in people, in cattle, in other wildlife. Um, population structure is actually a critical component of, of, the in, of in, uh, influencing how, uh, how diseases transmit through populations of hosts. Culling alters badger population structure in ways that accelerate transmission, and that undermines the benefits for TB control. Um, it doesn't always cause increases in cattle TB, but if it didn't happen, probably the improvements that you would see in cattle TB would be greater than they, than they actually are. By contrast, it appears likely that badger population structure is likely to actually enhance the efficacy of vaccination because they're already mixing with small numbers and when, uh, with small numbers within their social groups. If you don't disrupt that, the vaccination, you, know, you, you, you have to vaccinate, you can get away with vaccinating relatively small numbers and still have a benefit. Badger vaccination is likely to be cheaper than culling because of this issue of policing and it's unlikely to cause harm. It's not likely to increase TB in cattle. But at the moment, we're not yet at a point of knowing what its contribution to cattle TB is likely to be. Thank you very much. <laughs>